So, we're back in Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> it's been a while, but a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So, Matthew chapter 15, verse 11 says this. Not that which goeth into the mouth of a... Excuse me. Not that... Not... <laughs> Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. That which comes out of the mouth defiles a man. As we've talked about here before, as Jesus has talked about before, you better watch your mouth. And he said that a few chapters back in Matthew 12, 34 through 37, here's what he said. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So, not taking too much time, but I want to say a couple of things about those verses in Matthew 12, 34 through 37. <clears throat> Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And that's the key. What we say displays where we're at. Okay? What comes out of your mouth is the fruit of what's in your heart. When Jesus says a good man and an evil man, as we've talked about before, these are descriptive terms of a person's position. <clears throat> no one is good. Only God is good. We know that. So when Jesus says a good man, he's talking about someone who is declared good. That's like saying in the Psalms, you read about the righteous compared to the wicked or the just compared to the unjust. This is a person that is positionally good before God through faith in him. Because no one is good, only God. So <clears throat> the next verse, Matthew 12, 36 uh, excuse me, Matthew 12, 37, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. It's not saying that you're saved based on how you talk. It's saying that how you talk proves whether you're saved or not. That's what it's saying. See that? You understand? In other words, one can only be justified in the sight of God by faith. But how does everybody in your life know that you're justified? They can't see that invisible miracle that took place the moment you were saved. Only God sees that. But everybody can hear what you say and see what you do. And so your speech, Jesus is saying, proves whether you are good or evil, whether you are justified or not. And so, by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. <clears throat> How about Matthew 26, 73? Matthew 26, 73. This is when Peter was uh, standing with the people, warming himself at the fire of the enemy. And after a while came unto him that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Does your speech betray you? What do you say? What do you talk about? What comes out of your mouth? Because Peter was identified by his speech. They knew he was a Galilean because of his speech. Do people know you're a Christian because of your speech? Or do you sound like everybody else? Psalm 10:7. Psalm 10, 7, thy speech betrayeth thee. Now that can be good or bad, if the speech is good. Psalm 10, verse 7, 
<clears throat> now this is we talked about the righteous, the wicked. Okay, this is a this is what God says about the wicked. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. See? So he's wicked, but he's proving it by what he says. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. Now that dealt with unbelievers there and in the psalm. How about Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3? This is going to deal with believers. So we'll start with Ephesians 4, 29 through 31. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 29 through 31 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. See, you're saved. Stop it. Watch your mouth because it grieves the Holy Spirit. And then Colossians 3, 8 through 10. And it's not just profanity either. What did it say? Let no corrupt, no corrupt communication. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately, desperately wicked. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We should pray like David, I believe it was. He said, Lord, set a watch on the door of my lips that I sin not with my tongue. The Bible says, let us be slow to speak, swift to hear, slow to wrath. And then Colossians 3, 8 through 10 says, now, now that you're saved, now that you're born again, now that the Holy Spirit's living in you, giving you the power, put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. That's what comes out of our mouths sometimes. Lies. Or maybe not quite the truth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Okay? We're new creatures in Christ now if we're born again. So let's not behave like or talk like or think like the old way. Put off the old. Put on the new. Walk in it. <clears throat> Matthew 15, verse 12. <clears throat> Let me read 11 and 12. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Offended. They were offended by what Jesus said. Many times people are not going to like what you say, especially if it's biblical. This has been the experience of all who have stood for the truth and spoken the truth throughout history. Here's a quote I heard on Facebook of all places. Listen to this. Powerful and true. You'll know it when you hear it. The only thing people hate more than a liar is someone who always tells the truth. <clears throat> the only thing people hate more than a liar is someone who always tells the truth. And John 3.19 tells us why. Jesus said, This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's why people hate the truth because they're in darkness, their deeds are evil, and the truth convicts, exposes. And that doesn't feel too good when you're not walking in it, when you don't want it, when you don't love it, when you don't believe it. We were all there at one time. Praise God, we're not there anymore. John 5, 33. <clears throat> you don't need to turn there. John 5, 33. We're talking about 
people being hated for speaking the truth, offended because they heard the truth. Look at John the Baptist. Jesus said this about John the Baptist in John 5, 33. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. Guess what? John got his head cut off. For what? Jesus said, because he bare witness unto the truth. How about John 8, 40? John 8, 40. Here's what Jesus said to the Jews as he was having this conversation back and forth with them. <clears throat> he said to the Jews, Now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. You seek to kill me. What did he do? He told him the truth from God. John 18.37 John 18.37 Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Well, we know what happened to Jesus, right? Blessed be his name. First Timothy 2, 1 through 4, and then we'll move on in Matthew. First Timothy 2. 2, 1 through 4. <clears throat> now, I could have just read verse 4, but I wanted to give the context. So here it is. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, so this is Paul instructing Timothy on how to operate and uh, lead God's flock. Okay, these are instructions. We call them the pastoral epistles, instructions for a pastor on how to lead the flock of God. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Huh, interesting. Sundays are packed, but prayer night isn't at most churches. But, but the Bible says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Here it is. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So we see here we should be praying for that. And we should be speaking the truth. Instead of speaking all those other things that are wrong, we should be speaking the truth so that men might hear the truth, believe the truth, understand the truth, come to the knowledge of the truth, and be saved. I encourage you two things I'll mention. One, uh, we, sh we should do a study on the word truth in the Bible. Google that or search that in the Bible. True, the word truth. It's very important to God. Very important. You'll find that word a lot, especially in the New Testament, I noticed. Also, <clears throat> there's a video. I think it's free now on the Internet. It's called The Truth Project. If you've never seen it, I would recommend it. Now, unfortunately, he uses the uh, NIV in it, which I can't stand. But even in that corrupted uh, book, the word truth appears many times. Uh, so anyway, it's called the Truth Project. If you Google that, was I found it to be a blessing. So back to Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to be in verse 13. He answered, that is, Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. The word of God 
is a two-edged sword. Some <clears throat> will be pierced by it and receive it into their heart unto everlasting life. Others will be slain by it and go into everlasting punishment. John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus said this, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We talked about this last time we were together. Many people say they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe Jesus. They don't agree with what the Bible teaches. And if you don't agree with what the Bible teaches, then you don't believe in Jesus. Because what did he say? He that rejecteth me. Oh, I would never reject Jesus. They say, I, I, don't, I don't reject Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But Jesus says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. If you don't believe the Bible, you're rejected Jesus Christ. Period. That's what he says. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the word of God, the same shall judge him in the last day. And of course, you know, Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, the word of God is quick, that is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And I want you to notice in the discussion we're having about the word of God, and, the, and judgment will be based on the word of God, will be judged by the word of God. Notice the connection there in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, if you never noticed that. God's word and God's judgment. See how close connected? What does it say? It says uh, the word of God is mentioned in verse 12, and then we're going the fact that <clears throat> with whom we have to do. See, it speaks of our personal accountability to God, and it's connected to the word of God. You see that? I like what uh, Pastor Charles Lawson says about Hebrews 4.12, how it says it's a uh, <clears throat> discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He says, the Bible is the only book that reads you while you read it. He said, you think you're reading the Bible? The Bible's reading you. Amen. Alive and powerful. It's just like, and so we see here in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, exactly what Jesus said in John 12, 48, which we mentioned. Okay. And that the word he spoke in the same will be our judge in the last day. Like I said, or excuse me, like Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. And that also reminds me of a prayer that I pray regularly. I not only ask God to bring people here, but I ask him to bring who he wants and to keep away who he wants. And that's a good prayer since every plant that our Heavenly Father hasn't planted is going to be rooted up. So I might as well pray in, in line with that and say, Lord, please bring here who you want here and keep away who you don't want here. <clears throat> so back to Matthew 15, verse 14. Not only did he say, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. He said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. 
First, Jesus says, let them alone. That means leave them, leave them, leave them. I looked it up. It's translated leave many times, that same word in the New Testament. Leave them. And you know, the application for you and I is that sometimes you just have to let people go. It reminds us of the rich young ruler. He was close to salvation. And then he walked away because he wasn't willing to forsake his wealth. You notice Jesus didn't chase him down and say, hey, hey, wait, come back. Now, we should definitely plead earnestly with people. We should urge them, beg them, please repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if they reject him, then we move on to the next opportunity. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying don't continue in earnest prayer for them. I'm talking about what we're saying here. Okay. And our responsibility as believers is to sow the good seed of the word of God. The results are not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to sow the seed of the word of God. God will deal with the results and consequences. But by all means, pray for those, even if they reject what you're saying to them. And as in all things that pertain to the Christian life, the main thing I believe is to seek to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit to know how and what and when and how long to pray for seeds that you planted. Sometimes it takes a long time, a lot of prayers. So that's between you and God. But as far as preaching the word and sowing the good seed of the word of God, sow the seed. If they, if they accept it, praise God. If they don't, move on. <clears throat> Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Everyone and anyone who does not believe the Bible is blind. And those who have some beliefs and traditions which contradict the Bible have at least partial blindness. In other words, praise God, he gave me this quote. In other words, listen, the measure a person submits their way of thinking and living to the word of God, the less blindness they will have. Let me say that again. The measure a person submits their way of thinking and living to the word of God, the less blindness they will have. The greatest sin that there is, is idolatry. Not only is idolatry the greatest sin there is, it's not just number, it's so bad that it didn't just make number one on God's top 10 list. It made number one and number two. Let me read it. <clears throat> Exodus 20, verse one, God spake all these words saying, I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Here it is. Commandment number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Those are not suggestions, as many have said, not God's 10 suggestions. They are God's 10 commandments. 
And so the greatest sin there is, is idolatry. And that's why God mentions it twice. You know, out of 10, that's a lot. Twice. Exactly. So my point is what? Well, back in Matthew 15, where we've been for quite a while, the passage that we're dealing with there is teaching and, do- and following doctrines of men and traditions of men as compared to the word of God or instead of the word of God or in contradiction of the word of God. That's the context, right? We're talking about blindness and traditions and doctrines and beliefs of men. And so why am I bringing up idolatry? Because if something's not according to the word of God, it's idolatry period that's why see jesus said they're blind leaders of the blind because they're following man's traditions and teachings rather than the word of god so they are blind leaders of the blind and that connects to psalm 115 psalm 115 verses 4 through 8 listen Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. Now listen. What did Jesus say? Blind leaders of the blind. Idolatry brings blindness. What, Psalm 115, verse 8. They that make them are like them. And so is everyone that trusteth in them. See, blind leaders of the blind, they're all blind. And they're going to fall into a ditch. And that fall is going to be great depending on what you're talking about. Maybe a fall into the bottomless pit where you always fall and you never stop falling. That's why it's called the bottomless pit. Think about that. I never thought about that. I heard uh, Charles Lawson, as a matter of fact, and one other person I heard about that. The, one of the terms of for hell is the bottomless pit. Well, let's think about that. That means there's no bottom. So imagine a, a f- falling forever. You know how scary it is? I, I, was a, I think it was st- silly, but I jumped out of an airplane one time uh, to go skydiving. And I can tell you that the feeling of falling until the, uh, was pretty terrifying. Uh, and I'm talking about from the point I jumped out of the plane until the point I hit uh, maximum velocity. You know, once you get to a point where you're just you're not going any faster after that. That between the plane and that speed was uh, something else. So anyway, not to get on that, but bottomless pit. Don't want to go there. So repent, believe in Jesus Christ. Because uh, if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall to the ditch. And so idolatry brings blindness. And that's why I read those verses in Psalm 115. And so I'll say this. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Then Jesus said, both shall fall into the ditch. And you know what that teaches us? Both shall fall into the ditch. It teaches us that blindness doesn't only affect the person who's blind. It also affects those who follow them. Your family your wife, your children, your flock, if you're a pastor. What we believe and do affects others for good or bad. So make sure it's right and make sure it's biblical. And what should we do then? How can we make sure what we're doing and following and believing is right and biblical. Well, I could go to many verses. Of course, it should be biblical and based on the word of God. But practically, how can we know that? Well, let's get some answers in Matthew 7. 
Matthew 7, starting, I'm going to read verses 3 through 5 here. <clears throat> Jesus said, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So, if they be blind, leaders of the blind, how can we make sure that we're not blind and that we're not leading others astray? Well, cast out the beam out of your eye is a good place to start, okay? Make sure that you are walking in the light in fellowship with God. Make sure that you're not walking in darkness. And what that means is, as a believer, means that all known sin in your heart and life is confessed and forsaken. See, we are sinful, unfortunately, as believers. We, 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 we're so corrupted, we don't even know. Only God knows how bad we are, unfortunately, for now. That's not going to last forever, praise God. But right now, we are, we are sinful, we're corrupted. But there is a big difference in the Bible between sinfulness and known unrepentant sin for the believer. It's critical. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. Am I getting ahead of myself? Probably. Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's talking to believers. That's not for unbelievers. Um if we confess our sins. So what happens is a believer, when we, when we sin knowingly and willfully, we have just put ourselves out of fellowship with God. So one, that's why I said, once we are aware of it, once we know that we have sinned, once we're not, that's when you have to confess it and forsake it, stop it. And that will, first John one nine comes in, bam, because of, because of, uh, the blood of Christ, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. Okay? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise God. Known and unknown. What? But, it, but what does it say? If we walk in the light, what does that mean? We're confessing and forsaking all known sin. So we've got to get that beam out of our eye. And that's a good place to start. Uh, so we can see to make sure that we're not blind or leading others astray. And then Matthew 7, um, that was 3 through 5. How about verses 7 and 8? Okay, so we started with getting the beam out, right? Make sure we don't have any known sin in our lives. Now, what's the next step? Pray. How can we make sure that we're not blind and leading others astray? Pray. Ask. Ask. And it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. For every one that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. Him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Right? So make sure any confessed and known sin, because by the way, any known and unconfessed sin in your life is going to affect your prayers too. So we got to start with getting the sin out first. That's why in the Bible, the message is always first repent. See? Uh, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So first get the beam out. If you want to see, if you don't want to be blind, if you don't want to lead others astray, make sure we any confessed and known sin, uh, any sin known and unconfessed is confessed and forsaken. That you get in the beam out and then ask for God's help. Pray that we would not be deceived or blinded, that we would not allow anything in our lives that could cause blindness, speaking of idolatry or traditions and beliefs and practices that contradict the Word of God. And by the way, very specifically, not only are we praying for guidance and for wisdom, but in verse 11, Matthew seven eleven, Jesus talks about if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Now, in Luke, the parallel passage, it tells us that the good things Jesus is referring to is 
the Holy Spirit. How much more will your Heavenly Father give Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Not the person of the Holy Spirit, but the power, leading, presence, and work of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, what's He called? Who's He called? The Spirit of what? Truth. The Spirit of truth who will guide us into all truth. So that's what we need if we don't want to be blind or lead others astray. And also, 1 Samuel 15, 23. 1 Samuel 15, 23. Good to be back. Praise the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, 23 powerfully warns us that if we persist in rebellion against the word of God, We're in big trouble. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. Wait, wait, wait. Rebellion against what? Stubbornness in view of what? Keep reading. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. See? The word. Is this book amazing? Or what? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Hello, wait a minute. We, I just learned something right there. Listen. Rebellion and stubbornness brings blindness. Because what did, I, what did we learn already? Idolatry is a sure way to blindness. Well, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Idolatry brings, brings blindness. So, how about that? Reminds me of James 1.22. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Want to put on a blindfold? Listen to what I'm saying to you right now and don't do it. Read your Bible every day and don't do what it says. Go to church every Sunday and don't do what you learn. Call yourself a Christian and don't keep God's commandments. And you're putting a blindfold on yourself and deceiving yourself. Guaranteed. And if we continue to persist in rebellion against God's word <clears throat> as a group, as a nation, which this nation has already, we can actually come to the point where there is no remedy, but only judgment. And I'm going to read to you what I mean. We're just about done. Second Chronicles 36, 14 through 16, <clears throat> speaking about the nation of Israel. I believe we've reached this point in America. Listen to what it says. Matter of fact, I believe that the world, this country, and the majority of the professing church has reached this point today. I'm sad to say. It says, all the chief priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked, they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words. They despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people and there was no remedy, till there was no remedy. That's where I think we're at today. There's no remedy, only judgment. A Christian that's born again can never lose eternal life. I'm talking about the here and now in this world. I think we've reached the point that there's no remedy but judgment. And judgment must begin at the house of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, 
verses 9 through 13 says this. How about you want a minute? You want a ministry? You want a ministry from God? Here's Isaiah's ministry call from God. You know Isaiah 6, right? I saw the Lord seated on the throne, and God said, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. And God said, Go. Tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and be healed. How do you like that for a ministry? Go and pronounce judgment. They're not going to get it. They're not going to repent. Judgment. There's no remedy. And then said I, broken hearted as a prophet should be, Isaiah said, then said I, Lord, how long? How long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. That's where we're at today, I think, right there. That's where we're at today. But praise God. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you at that point. Thank God. Verse 12 is there. Isaiah, excuse me, verse 13, Isaiah 6, 13. But, but... But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return and be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. In other words, God's remnant, God's little flock. Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom.